Chat Ajele and Zir for Yervanta Aracha gets for Kam Hosim Misht Ajuke or Yerevan Alamaster Hoska and Clerno be the name, but yet a Hartsuner on the Quercha, higher no Granak Hartsuner. Okay, presentation coming soon. Okay. All right, my name is Kevor Keshishan. I work for NXP Semiconductors, uh, like Yervan said. Uh, based in Austin, Texas. I manage uh, the engineering teams that do mostly processing. So it's lots of semiconductor content, hardware. And I'm gonna talk about, actually the title is very telling. You know, it's, it's, it's called about secure connections for a safer world. And uh, you know, there's lots of concepts in there. And I'm gonna to touch on a few of them and then go a bit more in detail in a few others. And if you have any questions you know, later on, we can, we can dive deeper into it. So NXP, basically, we were in over 30 countries, uh, lots of offices, over 90 offices. We have about 30,000 engineers spread all over. Uh, long history between uh, NXP's, the current NXP is a merger from, uh, you know, NXP from Philips and also from uh, Motorola Freescale. So lots of history there in dealing with uh, automotive, with industrial uh, IoT, lots of history with uh, microcontrollers. Uh, this is the engineering team, so we have lots of locations. As you see, it's truly a global company. Uh, we manage hardware, software, uh, systems, uh, lots of uh, architecture groups looking into these different systems. So we have uh, really four, uh, four target markets. You know, obviously, the, uh, the main, the core of the business is automotive. And I'm gonna talk about that a bit, and you see how the intelligence systems are kind of taking over that. Industrial and IoT is a big part of uh, the portfolio. Lots of microcontrollers, lots of smart microcontrollers. Then we have mobile. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, NXP has been part of the mobile, both from intra infrastructure and also on the edge side, and then also the communication infrastructure. So uh, this is a view of where our products go. So you see it's, uh, it's pretty much uh, everywhere. It touches on our daily lives. Like I said, I'm gonna talk about a you know, few items, but just quickly going there, uh, you know, banking, we're big in banking. We have all kinds of secure solutions, uh, smart cards. We are big on auto, I mentioned that. I'm gonna talk about auto a bit more. Uh, there's lots of uh, industrial IoT content where we deal with uh, you know, large uh, kind of manufacturing uh, situations, lots of heavy machinery, power, power electronics. Also we have, uh, you know, of course, the car is a big part with infotainment in there, and then lately with uh, lots of controls on uh, how to replace the driver, basically ADAS, and uh, uh, how to make the, the, the car safe. So if you look at the, this kind of uh, situation, this is years ago, so we had all these verticals where people were developing solutions for different areas, different markets. So, so we had, of course, on the consumer side, had to do lots of with the transactions, with online sales with uh, you know, safe kind of uh, 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 systems. Of course, there's wearables. People wear uh, either on their wrist, their watches, health, uh, health equipment. Then you had the, uh, the smart home, all kinds of smart appliances. Again, solutions developed as a point, uh, point kind of uh, you know, isolated systems. Then you get uh, you know, safety and security. Uh, related aspects, a uh, long history again, the developing safe systems and secure systems. And the, the two are kind of slightly different, but very well interconnected. And of course, you know, the concept of smart cities and uh, smart industry. So if you look at all of these, uh, you know, these things have been developing over the last 20 years as kind of independent verticals with not too much of a, uh, of a relationship. And over the last, you know, I would say a good part of a decade, this concept of, uh, you know, things happening in the cloud, also things happening on the edge started emerging, right? You know, if you look at the cloud, it's, these are really the systems where you have the large servers, you know, think about Amazon, think about Microsoft, and, uh, you know, what happens there is, you know, you have large amounts of memory, uh, people keep on talking about AI and ML, lots of the training, lots of the data happens in the cloud. Now, what happens in reality is, you know, all the way to the, to the right there, there's lots of devices that work on the edge. And the edge is really close to the application. You know, whether you have something in the car, where you have a smartwatch, a uh, smart appliance, you know, healthcare professional, there's lots of examples that were uh, said today about all of this. And what's really needed is something to connect these two. And then that's where, uh, you know, we, we as an XP started playing in there. So we have if you look at the portfolio of products we have, it goes all the way from 
a very small microcontroller where it does you know, very simple tasks. You know, you're talking about hardware that's probably a few hundred million transistors so all the way, and I'm gonna talk about that really ADAS related car type of processing where you have tens of billions of transistors integrated. And you see how the diversity of the portfolio creates lots of challenges from both development perspective on the hardware, but uh, you'll see as software is becoming a, a big challenge also, where the focus is really that, where the uh, software investment is gonna be. And then for, from an experience perspective, uh, I keep on mentioning the uh, safety and security. Safety is very important. Take an example, uh, if you have a car, let's say, you wanna make sure that there's no failures happening for whatever reason, I'll, I'll mention that very briefly to you see what potential failure can, can happen. Uh, Quickly, uh, people think about smart devices. What is a smart device? You know, we start all the way from the, from the right there where you, know, you, have, you have a vacuum cleaner that moves around and uh, collects dust. And then uh, you start moving to, uh, more, towards the, uh, more towards the right here and then you see that uh, you, you get almost to the way of a robot. And from our perspective, all these systems have similar uh, attributes. So first of all, they sense their sensors, right? Uh, whether it's vision or temperature or any kind of sensor, especially now with the cars, you have radars, you have lidars, and then they, they think, basically that's where the, the processing, uh, processing enters into the play, and I'm gonna talk about the processing and the challenges there. And eventually they communicate, either with existing systems within that uh, subsystem, uh, you know, different parts of a subsystem, and you'll see it in a car, a good example is the car, and eventually they act. So the acting could be actuators, you know, triggers that can you know, move the car in a certain direction or any other action, right, if you're talking about uh, a robot. You know, from our perspective, really, a car, you know, eventually it's gonna turn into, uh, into a robot, right, with, with more uh, kind of dexterity there, with uh, you know, more refined movement uh, situation. But this is the commonality of, uh, of really all, all smart systems. And uh, just from a processing perspective, again, if you look at the system complexity, you know, it's moving uh, you know, from uh, all the way to the right of where very relatively simple systems to all the way very complex, uh, complex systems. Yeah, so from an automotive perspective, uh, zero is a big number for us. So basically, if, we, if you look at uh, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's on the left side here, zero time wasted, this is talking about all kinds of efficiencies, whether you know, you're sitting in traffic, what's the fastest route, how you can find the parking space, to all the way that's whatever internal in the system. And then uh, from accidents perspective, that's the safety aspect. Uh, you don't want any, anything to happen due to either human error or security related aspect. You don't want anything to, to any harm to happen to the passengers. You know, it could be your family, it could be passengers, it could be uh, clients, it could be just general kind of customers. So, it's very important for, uh, for us to have uh, you know, safe and secure systems there so that things are not you know, going out of their operating range and then everything is done according to the original plan. And then for that, we have actually safety protocols that are uh, very specific for NXP and they go beyond what uh, usually government bodies or you know, other certification boards uh, kind of set in place. So that's why you know, people like to do business with NXP. And of course, the, the, the last one there is really the electrification of the car. Even if you put aside the autonomous driving, uh, there's a, this big effort going on in turning the cars into electric. Uh, traditionally, those, those, you know, the cars have been, I and mean, everyone knows this, have been electromechanical system, lots of uh, controls happening, lots of hydraulics, lots of uh, really actually mechanical parts moving, but you know, the last decade, you know, these new startups in uh, Silicon Valley started turning this into uh, mostly a software problem, right? You know, the car is becoming a software, uh, really, platform on wheels. So, uh, but uh, even if you put that aside, uh, you know, this, this whole electrification aspect, everything is becoming drive-by-wire. Systems, mechanical systems are being replaced by microprocessors, even the wiring in the car, that's roughly around 30% of the cost of a car, including the weight and actually the cost of manufacturing car, is being replaced by uh, kind of interconnect protocols. You know, it could be Bluetooth, it could be other short range kind of secure protocols, but all of that is actually introducing lots of complexity in the system. Uh, but, uh, you know, one aspect is of course, you know, if you look at from a green uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, paradigm perspective, you're, we're trying to cut emissions, but no emission, no kind of pollution happening, no carbon footprint. So, so these are the things that, 
that are important for us. Now, this is an important, uh, interesting uh, paradigm we're moving into. So if you start from, uh, from the left side here, uh, I mentioned that there's, uh, you know, there's the aspect of sensing. So radar, right now, I know there's other technologies, but radar is very big. So uh, you know, radar basically detecting objects. Uh, you can have uh, you know, different radar systems installed on all corners of the car. You can have corner radars, front radars. Uh, the technology is moving very fast because you, know, uh, you need higher granularity. You need to be differentiating objects way ahead uh, just because of the ratio of the speed versus you know, how you can react. You need to differentiate objects or identify objects within multiple lanes, so that increases the complexity. Also, there's uh, some angle that's you know, the third dimension. So you need to see all of this. So you take that system and then you add it into uh, domain controllers. And I'll talk about domain controllers a bit. Basically, it takes all this information and try to process it, uh, and then eventually goes into, uh, into a gateway processing. Uh, gateway processing is actually a concept that's emerging lately. Uh, if you look at the data generated within a car, just from gathering the data from the surrounding and then also the data that's generated within it from driver's perspective or operating conditions, there's a lot of them, lots of data, lots of bits to move, move around. So our products currently have uh, the concept of a network processor that's sitting actually in the car um, and then doing all the traffic management. Yeah, most of the time, this data is not very interesting, for instance, right? I mean, nothing happening on the road. You know, most of our drives to work and back, or it's eventless, right? Nothing's happening. Every once in a while, something happens, and then that's where the intelligence kicks in, that you want to differentiate from all that data to, uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, that there's meaningful, first of all, meaningful decisions are being made to keep things operational and safe, but also, you know, from just the data logging perspective, you want to make sure that you're, you're, you're keeping the data that's important. And eventually, you move all the you know, vehicle dynamic system where it's actually controlling the different parts, whether it's the wheels, the brakes, the transmission system, the steering wheel, the direction of the car. And, uh, you know, of course, we, uh, we're all familiar with the, with the braking and all the other dynamics. So uh, the, this prediction actually is, is uh, probably might, might come to fruition, uh, might quicker, the, the first bullet there. I talked about the central gateway that's managing all the data moving in the car. It, it's absolutely necessary. Otherwise, uh, you will have isolated systems that, uh, uh, that will not be able to communicate. Now, the other, uh, the other driving or interest from a consumer perspective is the car is turning into your familiar environment. So you go in, it's almost like you walk in and you have your identity is detected. You know, right now everyone's familiar about the different settings where if you have different drivers, uh, you know, kind of the seat distance, the, the, the steering wheel height, things like that. Even the climate control preference is uh, kind of uh, set based on who gets in the car because they, they can figure out from the, from the key fob that you have on you or even from your cell phone. But things are moving into more and more. Uh, uh, something that's becoming very familiar. I mean, you can walk in and you can have, you can have your, uh, you know, sound system and lighting and, you know, all of these things uh, be set just because, you know, the car can identify who's doing that. And there's different technologies, communication technologies that we're working on. Uh, one, of, one of them is very short range, very low power. The other one is more wider range, so they can see who's approaching the car and whether they need the car needs to take an action. If you look purely from an infotainment perspective, Really, the, the cockpits are changing. So you can have this configurable cockpit. Your, your dashboard can change uh, depending on the mode you set for driving, but also your own preferences. There's also all the multimedia, all your music, uh, you know, video entertainment for the passengers. You can have uh, you know, the radio. And audio is very important because lots of the things in the car, especially if you're moving into more autonomous driving, it's going to be voice and gesture controlled. So you need to have this voice recognition uh, systems in the car, but also the gesture recognition. You know, right now, we do lots of things on the dashboard. It's very tactile, but you know, in the near future, you know, the, the, the cameras in your car will be able to sense what you're trying to do or what you're trying to instruct. So uh, again, more of the same, a bit more in detail. So uh, the, the part that's actually very interesting is the, is the thinking part. You know, if you take any of these complex systems, the thinking part is really where uh, really the challenge is from a complexity. Uh, some of these chips can go up to 20, 25 billion transistors. So you're, you're talking about very large uh, systems. And then the software complexity would be associated you know, relatively 
this is the car architecture that I was talking about. So all the way to the left is what we have currently today. Uh, you know, over the years, probably the last 30 years, as electronic systems have becoming more and more mainstreams, uh, the car manufacturers were trying to insert uh, features that were very beneficial. And some of them had safety, some of them were related to comfort, some of them purely entertainment. Uh, like I said, everyone's familiar with the, the, the braking systems, and that happened a long time ago. So they would install these systems, but they were isolated systems. Then came the entertainment system. Then it came some type of detection. But the challenge with that is all of them are isolated, and then most of the time for, are from different vendors. So we start moving quickly what's, uh, what's currently actually in the middle, and the middle is the domain. So think about the domain where you have your vision, all your cameras, right? So that's one domain. Then you have your uh, you know, radar sensors, that's another domain. Then you have your uh, vehicle body controls, you have vehicle engine and dynamics control. And then in the middle of it sits the, the network processor where it manages all this communication between domains. Uh, so think about this now. I mean, these chips are fairly large and uh, they're gonna have a very complex software content on it. Think about all the complexity that goes into developing a a complex software system, uh, multi-core. Some of these devices have up to 16 uh, you know, CPUs in there, very large CPUs, trying to process all that data. And then uh, we're moving uh, slowly towards the, the, uh, the other end of the spectrum where you know, people are talking about a very large central processing. Some people are calling it brain. Some people are calling it the control mechanism that sits really in the middle, right? And then all the... Uh, we move from the domain into zonal. So if you look at you know, any part of the car, you say, okay, on the left side, front left side of the car, I have my radar system, I have my vision systems, but the, the intelligence is barely enough to do some processing. All the intelligence happens in the middle, which is the, the, the central kind of uh, system for the car. So right now, between the car manufacturers and tier ones and the you know, solution providers like NXP, we're trying to figure out which one is the best uh, architecture for, uh, you know, for the car of the future. Now, you know, we're talking about cars in 2028 production and beyond, right? So uh, there's ways, I mean, you might think there's a you know, long time away, but uh, actually these systems are being designed currently today because of the long time it takes for, for us to qualify it, certify it, make it secure, make sure there's no issues from a manufacturing perspective. Um, software, you know, someone mentioned software today. Uh, we're talking about really uh, the concept of software-driven hardware architecture. So if you look at the graph there, the lower curve is really, you know, how fast the number of, uh, you know, embedded flash is growing within a device. So that's, that's, uh, that's a particular IP that we put in the, in the chip where it stores uh, memory. And then how fast the lines of code, uh, the, the graph at the top is really uh, the number of millions of uh, software code, uh, lines of code that's, uh, that's growing. And then you see that all of these systems are becoming very complex systems and that they have to connect to each other. You know. And then when we look at it from that perspective, it becomes clearer that the you know, domain control and zonal architecture are, are very, very critical. Some examples of AI, you know, there's no talk without AI these days. So uh, uh, the AI can be anywhere from identifying you know, how we're gonna go from point A to B or optimizing the operation of the car based on existing data. And then usually what happens is uh, all these hardware I showed have some type of AI processing engine. Usually the, the training of the neural net is done in the, in the cloud. And then what happens is uh, we have this concept of trimming down these neural nets so that they can be easily uh, you know, implementable in hardware and software. We call them inference engines and that they go on the chip. So our products all the way from the low end have the capability of uh, you know, processing some AI. And then the applications are numerous, right? And then the most complex one is really the driver replacement, what we call ADAS, uh, where you're actually getting rid of the person doing all the control and generating all the decisions, right? This is another one I mentioned about the, the need for a gateway or network processor in the, in the car. On the, on the left side here, you see you know, how fast is the data generation. I mean, these cars can generate, uh, the number there is kind of the lower end, four terabytes of data per hour. So think about this. You're driving for a few hours and a number of cars in the city. All of that data has to be sent somewhere. That's where you need, uh, you need a, 
IT infrastructure that manages that data, secures it. Some of the data is actually personal data, right? You know, even your, you know, where you're going, your trajectories, your daily routines. Uh, the, the cameras are so powerful, uh, or going to be so powerful in the cars that they can even diagnose other features. You know, someone was talking about, you know, medical aspects. Uh, then what happens is, uh, you know, the network, how fast that data moving. Some of the data is very important from uh, critical decision making. So you need to move the data very fast so that the processing uh, elements on the edge have access to, to that and then they can take the decisions very quickly. And then the, the right side there is really the, the compute power. Uh, TOPS is uh, an acronym for Tera Operations Per Second. Uh, you know, these are actually, we're moving into uh, you know, the mainframe or the large computers of you know, 50 years ago that you need to have them operation in a very small footprint. Uh, safety and security, so these are the areas from our perspective and uh, we work with the industry where things might go wrong, right? You know, functional ex safety where you don't want any failures or accidents to happen due, uh, due system failures, right? And then there are processes in place where, uh, for instance, you have, uh, you have one of the systems fails in the car, we have redundancy, we have checks, and then uh, we decide how to move the car out of harm's way, right? So, uh, things happen... Uh, uh, in an unexpected way, you have to secure the, the, the passengers. Then you have uh, device reliability. That has to do with manufacturing. You have to make sure that there's no manufacturing defects from a semiconductor uh, manufacturing perspective that aren't uh, you know, making the devices fail. Then you have the safety, human error. You don't want you know, people uh, kind of falling asleep or miscalculating, sometimes misinterpreting the GPS aspect. Now, you see that as we're moving into fully autonomous driving, some of these aspects are, are going to disappear because, you know, a qualified system and a secure and safe system is going to take over. We also have uh, uh, issues that, you know, people can hack into, the, the last two items there, uh, can hack into the data set, uh, can hack into the car, because, the, you know, it's connectivity on all these subsystems and someone else can take over and then can use the cars as a weapon. I mean, we've seen instances of that happening, you know, people using cars or any moving vehicle for different, uh, you know, not, you know, not, not uh, positive aspects of it. So we have to prevent all of that. Quickly on IoT, so uh, most of us have been around, except the, the, the upper rows there, for, to witness all these uh, trends. So if you see, you know, first of all, there was the mainframe a long time ago, then we switched to mini computer, eventually the, uh, the PC evolution. And then every time you see is uh, uh, the, the vertical uh, kind of, uh, the, the vertical axis is really the number of units shipped. Now the interesting part is, uh, you know, someone mentioned uh, right before that, uh, you know, given the number of people in the, in the world, there's more, you know, connected devices shipped every year. Now, what happens with the, the AI and IoT, uh, people are kind of making estimates in the tens of billions, but I think those are very conservative. I mean, think about this. Uh, you know, Yervant mentioned this morning that, uh, you know, to enable AI, a whole bunch of things had to happen. I mean, obviously, you need the processing to, to increase tremendously, right? And we have that. You know, I mentioned that we're doing chips that have 10, 15, 20 billion transistors. Memory technology is becoming, uh, we can integrate larger memories in the chip or we have access to larger, cheaper memory and they're becoming very fast. And then most important thing is the connectivity between these devices. Now we have very high speed, you know, gigabit internet, the 5G. Then we have other technologies like for instance, you know, car to car, car to infrastructure, very short uh, range, but uh, you know, very precise uh, kind of communication that's happening so that these things can communicate. And then what making it happen as these systems are operating as one single brain. And then from my perspective, it's, you know, the AI and IoT, it's gonna be very exponential increase. It's not gonna flatten out like the other ones. Uh, and then some of it, uh, one of uh, the speakers mentioned is, today with the regular laptop, you can have a develop an AI that can uh, develop a neural net that can beat a grand, uh, you know, uh, chess grandmaster, right? Uh, this years ago, you know, we had, the, we had the IBM machine, we had Deep Blue that were trying to do that. So that technology is, is there and then for people to use it. Think about the paradigm of how smartphones became smartphones because, you know, people were able to develop all these apps, right? And then, uh, you know, you had thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of, uh, you know, developers that were writing apps for these, uh, for these systems and it became very pervasive. Same thing is going to happen with, uh, with AI. 
again, more of our offerings. So you see some of, the, some of them go into really small devices. I mean, you're talking about you know, wearables, you're talking about the, the, the rings that monitor your health, you know, all the way into all kinds of sensors. And then in the middle, you see the, the larger kind of footprint, hardware and software perspective. Uh, and then eventually, uh, you know, we go into really the, the heavy processing aspect of uh, you know, machine learning, machine learning algorithms. Now, today, the most pervasive one is really neural nets. And then you have really the deep neural nets, you have the convolution neural nets that are good for uh, you know, image processing. But purely from an AI perspective, there's lots of classes of algorithms that people have not used yet that can benefit uh, you know, accelerate things, you know, different classification of algorithms. Okay, so uh, different aspects at the top. Uh, some of them are, I already talked about, you know, voice recognition. I mean, it's, it's becoming really, you don't even think about it when you give, give instructions, even as simple as, you know, you ask your phone to dial a number, you're in the car. Uh, you know, other instructions. So, you know, the, the, the voice recognition aspect, the systems are very mature today, so they can recognize all kinds of instructions. Uh, Gesture control is going to be very important. It all has to do with you know, safety and security in the car, so you don't have to you know, reach out to a center console so you can make the gestures and things will happen. It goes all the way into uh, you know, looking at multi-camera kind of uh, monitoring, the smart homes. You know, all of these things, uh, think about it, there's different areas of input. This morning, uh, uh, our laureate for, for the award talked about uh, you know, multi-camera. So think about not just cameras, but think about all kinds of sensors feeding into data. And you know, it's humanly impossible to just synthesize all of them and make sense of it. But these processing, these, uh, processing elements, both hardware and software, are able to sensitize, uh, synthesize all of them and then make it into something that's very meaningful. Uh, in some of the product lines, we call them you know, sensor fusion, where you get all kinds of uh, sensors uh, feeding information and then you fuse the data and you build a different abstraction layer so that you can uh, you know, make a decision tree. Okay, now I'm going to talk about uh, you know, chips a bit just very quickly. What are the challenges developing systems like that? Uh, Moore's law, everyone heard about it. So if you look at these graphs, you know, the top one is really the number of transistors being integrated. Over the years, it's been very linear, very kind of steep growth. And then if you look at up to towards 2005, you know, if you look at the other metrics, you know, performance increased linearly as you added more transistors, performance increased similar way. As you added more transistors, you had the, the frequency, of how fast the CPU was running, increased similar way. The power was you know, managed the same way, so everything looked linear. Until you hit a point in 2005 where things started changing, right? And, uh, as you're increasing the number of transistors, challenges became uh, more and more apparent. So what happened in the first phase one is basically everything on the burden of uh, the manufacturing, the foundries, people who manufacture transistors. Transistors were faster, connectivity was faster. So things just by, by kind of the, uh, the advantage of you know, companies, hardware companies moving from one type of manufacturing to another one, you get you know, immediately two times the speed up. So you didn't have to do much. Then what happened was, okay, so just go over there. You know, the, the really last evolution was you know, developing uh, you know, transistors that were three-dimensional. So that way you have more control on the, uh, you know, on the characteristic of you know, both performance and power. So what happens uh, after 2005, you start adding more cores, and by cores I mean CPU. So now, you know, if you look at your cell phones, right? Any cell phone has uh, this uh, CPU subsystem that's at least eight cores, so four large, four small. Then you have another 10 to 12 uh, CPUs in there. So if, let's say we stay with eight. You know, adding eight, you know, processing cores doesn't mean your performance will increase eight times. So there's all kinds of inefficiencies in the system that needed to, to be worked out. And same from a power perspective. So. Now the challenge is really uh, looking at all kinds of design parameters, you know, lower latency buses, high speed buses, partitioning the architecture in a different way, so that you hide all these, uh, all these inefficiencies. And this is really an area for both hardware and software that my teams are involved in to, to make sure that as the, the semiconductor side, the physics, uh, you know, PhDs are improving the manufacturing uh, uh, you know, processes, on the design side, what hardware and software were able to, to harvest all of it. And this is my last slide. 
which we started, like I said, uh, every, you know, NXP is it everywhere that has, that has microcontrollers, that has, you know, power, uh, uh, you know, power actuators, that has, you know, smart machines, and, uh, and then this is pretty much covering all our daily aspects, right? You know, I guarantee you, if you start looking, you will have at least a dozen of NXP devices that you're using in your everyday and you're not, you're not aware of it, right? Uh, so, thank you. And 
you know, your kind of your constraints are your constraints from every set compared to if you're doing like a 15, 20 billion transistor, right? You have lots of resources, right? Your software doesn't have to fit in the, you know one you know flash memory inside the device. Uh, so what we do is, and then lately ISP has been transforming, is to, to take the learnings more aggressively from one area. Like I said, you know, some of these devices, devices are sold for like 50 cents, and all the way to the highest spectrum, you know, they sell for two, three hundred dollars. So uh, we're trying to see what the leverage is, both from uh, you know reusing all the IP, but also it's cost effective for us too. Uh, the, I gave you a few examples, but those are really uh, you know just. Just a few examples that uh, you know, just come to my mind right now. There's much more commonality that goes into there, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to leverage. Well, strategically, you're trying to enable your semiconductor sales, which much leveraging the verticals to sell more silicon, or rather uh, going vertically up into more integrated systems. We do both. We do both, actually. And the question was really, we're just trying to sell hardware or integrated solutions. Uh, some of them, so depending on the customers, like I said, if there's point solutions, uh, we, our customer base is probably 26, 30,000. Some of them, you don't even know, they're downloading stuff like ordering from catalog, downloading software. So those are, you know, it's just point sales, right? You send them, sell them a firmware and they go, right? The other ones, for instance, you're talking about any car maker, right? Any, you know, the, the Germans, the Americans, the Europeans, the Japanese, they need, they need system solutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we sell that. And actually for us, uh, you know, the challenge is really on the system side. And then the medical devices are kind of falling in between, uh, not as much as the, the, the complexity, but the, 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 I mentioned all the constraints that we put around them, right? Obviously, I'm not saying you're spending a small device, but it also has AI capabilities, all the software on there. So going back to your questions, we prefer to sell solutions, but part of our business is also very you know, small things, point devices, right? And that's where we're spending our R&D dollars actually to, to develop solutions for systems, right? More integrated. Right, and would you consider that move below would apply in the product and I would say in a quote move below, uh, would apply to the integrated solution as opposed to counting the number of transistors alone. No. Do you account the number of intelligence if you wish superposed with the number of transistors? Yeah, yeah there, there are actually there are actually uh, thoughts or schools out yeah. there. They're trying to see what's next. Because Moore's law, it's been very successful. Solid because engineers will try to make sure you know, it, it keeps on you know perpetuating. There are other metrics that are coming. I mean someone asked today what, what's the measure of intelligence, right? How do you measure it? You can say, you know, I have this many billion transistors, therefore I'm intelligent. So there's other metrics, and it's a very good point of view that people are trying to define these new metrics of what is the next one, what is the next law. Uh, as, as you can see, I mean, the, the things were much simpler, you know, 50 years ago. Yeah. Now uh, you have, uh, you know, the knowledge is actually growing double exponentially, and lots of people have, uh, have different views on there. Uh, but uh, things are definitely accelerating. The challenge for us is to contain the software cost and the software complexity. You're talking about you know hundreds of millions of lines of code compared to in a car, right? Compared to somebody, I didn't include that slide, but uh, you know, there was an example that the shuttle, you know, the space shuttle, had about you know tens of thousands of lines of code just because you know this was developed you know, 30 years ago. They had other constraints, but you see the complexity, and it's not just you know operation. Now you have all kinds of other stuff. Basically, think about this. You walk into a space, and a car is a space, and your environment comes with you, with everything that you like or everything that you need, right? And that comes with, I mean, yeah, you we know, put you know, hardware processing, uh, accelerators, things like that, but everything is a system, and then you hit it you know, on the head. And, you know, the systems, the vertical integration is where, where the interesting aspects are. Okay, yes, please. Yeah. Into kind of a bridge because 
Thank you.